Okay, so we've discussed principles by which you can make good self-paced materials. And in fact, our experiences have been that students give very consistent feedback that those are the kinds of things they're after. And so we have a high confidence that that's going to work well. When it comes to the in-class time, the time that we've deliberately freed up by moving all our content to self-paced form, then there's a much greater diversity of what students are looking for and what teachers might want to do. And so there's a big spread of kinds of good in-class activities that you can do. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to discuss basic principles for what you should and shouldn't do there, some ideas what you might want to try, and some traps to avoid. When it comes to in-class activities, there's no simple recipe you can follow. Really very different strategies work for different teachers with their natural inclinations and strengths. They work for different students with their preferences and strengths. And they work for different kinds of material. And different classes often have different goals. You might be trying to address some particular common misconception that students have. You might be trying to improve their understanding in general. You might be trying to give them some kind of skills. Or you might be trying to help the students apply their knowledge in an authentic, real-world kind of setting. And this diversity of needs and appetites has led to a similar diversity in good teaching styles. And there's a lot known about good teaching. And rather than try and cover all of that, let's look at some of the differences between teaching an in-class activity in a flipped classroom setting to teaching an in-class activity in a normal setting. So first and foremost, we've got rid of all the things that can be best done by students by themselves and put that into the self-paced learning. And so the key principle of all in-class activities is that they must be active. Now that's actually true of in-class activities where you're not using flipped classes as well. It's well understood that the more active your students are, the more they'll retain and the more they'll be able to do later on. And getting students more actively engaged is at the heart of the majority of successful teaching innovations. So look to minimize the amount of time that you speak to the entire group. And that means you can maximize the time you spend walking around the room talking to individuals. And listening, of course. One of the advantages of this approach is that you get more time to hear what students are thinking about, what their questions are, see what they're stuck on, that kind of thing. And of course, while you're walking around talking with people, they're working on a very specific exercise that you've set for the day. So you can get very specific information about what people are struggling with in a topic of your interest at the time. So it's very good as a teacher, you get a good connection to your student body. Now, if you can possibly manage it, we've found that it's best to get as close to a 1 to 15 staff-student ratio if you can. Although not all those staff necessarily need to be fully expert, they could be tutor level or someone in between the teacher and the student. But we found we needed something like that in order to have someone coming around and talking to people regularly enough. And I've spoken to other people that found that their ratio was more like one to five in a clinical kind of situation where they were really doing very high intensity work that needed lots of supervision. And I guess there will be situations where you might be able to get away with something more like 1 to 20 or 1 to 30 if people are working through large amounts of drills, say. So if it's not highly conceptually challenging and they need to be spoken to regularly. Besides choosing a highly active class plan, another good thing to do is to start with question time. It's standard to have that at the start of the class because students have come into your class and they've already engaged with new materials. So they've gone through new content in their self-paced learning materials and so they're going to have questions. There's a sort of cultural trap you can fall into at this point, especially if you're an experienced teacher. So what can happen is you've got a large number of students that have come in and they've dealt with new material and you haven't seen them do it. You might have perhaps produced those online materials or even written that textbook, but you still haven't seen them actually engage with it. So there's a strong tendency to go over that material again. In other words, there's a strong tendency to go out of this active student paradigm and into a kind of passive student paradigm where you recover all that material. And of course, that gives them less and less desire to actually engage outside of the class. And so you end up reverting back to a traditional non-flip classroom model by squeezing out all the time you're going to have doing your exercises. And I've now heard of multiple situations where people have attempted to take on the flip classroom model of teaching but have found that that question time, when they lost their courage and they just started devolving into teaching all the material again, they found that they didn't get any improvement in learning. Whereas exactly the same materials and class plans provided a significant uh, improvement in learning in other classes where teachers had the courage to stick to their guns. Now sticking to your guns in this case means use question time in a simply reactive way. If people don't have questions, get into the exercise, go in hard. In other words, the principle here is you mustn't have any safety net. 
If students are going to engage in your course, the way they get their information about the new content is from the self-paced learning materials. And you should organize your course so that, that is absolutely implicit and there's no real other way to get it. If they're having troubles with the content, of course they can ask questions. They can ask you questions individually when you're coming around and talking to them one by one. Or they can ask questions at that question time at the start of the class and you can answer back to the whole class and you can really clear up any problems with that content and any conceptual issues that students are having. But in the end, you have to expect your students to have engaged with the material and come up with their own questions and be ready for the exercises. And exactly how you do that is going to be the topic of the assessment talk that we'll have in the next video. But for now, we're just going to say you mustn't have a safety net. If you give them a safety net, they'll tend to use it and you'll tend to devolve back out of the flipped classroom model. On the plus side, I must say that question time at the start of class is usually a fairly effective time. It's a very efficient time because students have had a chance to try to process the material. When they're trying to come up with a question that they're lost when you first presented it, they don't have even enough time really to come up with a sensible question. They can just sort of express their confusion in some way. Whereas you often get very good questions in the flipped classroom model.